So let's kick off, um, if I may, with um, asking you all to say a little bit about who you are and what, what you do. So Jennifer, could I perhaps start with you, if that's all right? Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first things first, just want to test that you can hear me all right. Yep. Everything works fine. Okay. Great. So um, I'm Jennifer Boscard and Ching, um, working at Pite Asset Management. So I am a client portfolio manager within the thematic equities team. Um, and my specialty is in environmental, well, in environmental equities, basically, um, whether it's about the energy transition or whether it's on kind of larger environmental topics such as water management, um, biodiversity, definitely one of those. Uh, just a little bit more about me prior to joining Picte, I actually worked in the renewable energy industry for quite some time, and I also have a background in uh, energy and environmental uh, public policy. So um, I'm really excited about this discussion that we have today. Um, it's definitely very topical, let's put it that way. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Mohan, can I come to you next, please? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Mohan Gundu. I work as an equity investment analyst at uh, Stewart Investors and the Sustainable Funds Group. Um, we basically believe that including sustainability considerations actually helps improve investment returns. So it's actually a driver of returns for us. Um, and we've been running sustainability labeled funds since about 2005. Um, all the funds are SFTR9. And on a personal note, I basically spent about two decades on the sell side and, and was just basically intrigued by the annoying questions that my team would keep asking me as a broker and then basically became my favorite client. And so I joined the team about five years ago, and I'm based here in London. <laughs> that's, that's a great story. Thank you, Mohan. Um, Adam, can I come to you next, please? Yeah, of course, Julia, no problem. Just checking, you can hear me? Yeah, all good. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, Adam Robbins, uh, Senior Investor Relations Manor for, uh, Manager for Triodos Investment Management. So my role is to look after all relationships uh, that our business has here in the UK. I've been with Triodos for pretty much five years now, um, having spent the best part of 20 years in financial services, uh, predominantly on the sell side here in the UK. Um, and I guess preempted by the birth of my daughter almost six years ago, I decided to try and marry up my values with a, a more um, meaningful role, shall we say. A um, little bit of background on Triodos. Yeah, we, we, we are positive impact investors. It's all we do. Um, it's all we were set up to do almost 30 years ago. Um, it's all we're going to do moving forward. It's in our DNA. It runs through the entire business. Um, and we've got about six billion of assets under management. Um, as I said, all geared towards positive uh, impact. No, no legacy assets, no brown funds, uh, all, all SFDR, Article 9. So, um, yeah. <laughs> You use the words in our DNA. I normally put that as being a red flag. Um, if a company says that, <laughs> I would quite often <laughs> well, tell I people. You, to I walk hope you know away. us well enough, Julia, to know that that's not I, a red flag in this that, case. That was my. That was going to be my next comment. I've known Triodos for a really long time, um, and absolutely genuine. So yeah, clearly um, not a red flag in this situation. But I would take that as a semi-sensible comment with a lot of people that you talk to in this industry. Be really careful when they start talking DNA. It's, it's for many fund managers, it's deeply terrifying. Um, <laughs> Neville, last but of course not least, please, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Julia. Uh, it's good to be with everybody today. I'm Neville White. I'm Head of Responsible Investment at Eden Tree. Um, Eden Tree is a boutique fund manager. Responsible and sustainable investment is all we do. It's all we've done for 30 years. We're ultimately owned by a charity, the All Churches Trust, so kind of very different type of financial services um, organization. I've been with Eden Tree since 2010, and before that was Head of Ethical Investment for the Church of England's national investment bodies. So I moved from institutional to a retail type environment, um, but obviously had lots and lots of challenges at the church. So over 24 years, I've probably seen every anagram in this marketplace come and go, and I'm still standing. <laughs> and, and making your views known, um, especially likewise on, on LinkedIn, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, love, I love the straightness with which you answer things. It's fantastic. Um, it would be mildly terrifying, I guess, if I started doing that. But um, I, I, I try and I try I try and be a little bit more um, uh, hold back a little more, if you like. But I, I yeah, very much suggest following Neville's views on these things. Um, so four really, really brilliant speakers here, and thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Um, can I ask Jennifer then to kick off, please, given your background and, and look, biodiversity 
you know, we used to just talk about wildlife and nature and stuff, right? And we now talk about biodiversity. So biological diversity is what it's mashed together from. Um, but can I ask you to kick off and just give people a bit more on that? Because it's quite probable that a lot of people on this call are not experts mm -hmm. in that area. Sure, yeah, happy to kind of start and give a bit of context and background. Um, so as you said, uh, biodiversity, it's basically just biological diversity. And so kind of in very simple terms, it just refers to the kind of abundance or the variety of life species and organisms that can be found on Earth, right? Whether it's different um, genetic species, whether it's different ecosystems. And in terms of why it's important and also especially for us as investors, um, I think the fundamental kind of thing to come down here to, to realize is that our economic system, I mean, our societies depend on biodiversity for various types of ecosystem services. Um, and actually, as mentioned in this uh, Das Gupta review on, on biodiversity, which I'm aware that there will be a session on this later, uh, you know, the, the central, it's, it's important to realize that our economy is embedded into our, bio, uh, our biosphere and it's not external of it. And so that means that um, about, you know, just to give you some examples, uh, three quarters of our global crop output, for example, uh, relies on some form of insect pollination. Um, uh, other kind of aspects of biodiversity that are very important include regulation of the health of our soils, regulation of our climate. So we need to think about all of this as one common system uh, that we are also living within and what our economies depend upon. So the problem that we're actually having now is that since uh, you know, in the start of industrialization about 200 years ago, um, we have, let's say, traditionally not really been accurately capturing the value of natural capital, the value of these eco ecosystem services, and thus not really accurately reflecting how much we depend on these types of resources in our financial markets, in our societies. And so that has led to a lot of negative externalities, massive over-exploitation, deforestation, um, to the point where you know, we're using about, I think the figure is about 1.7 Earths uh, to kind of support humanity's current lifestyles as it is today. And so, um, and this is actually getting worse and worse. And biodiversity is now one of those biggest challenges that we have, because ultimately we are part of our biosphere. And so nature loss is a significant risk to corporate, financial and economic stability. Um, so that's, that being said, from an investment perspective, I think it's, it's actually... Um, very attractive, there's a very attractive investment rationale to take biodiversity very seriously. Um, and it's not just about, you know, oh, feeling good and being green and things like that, but it's really about um, a matter of risk mitigation to avoid kind of large scale disruptions to our uh, agricultural production, for example, to our climate. Um, and we do also truly believe that as society moves towards to start pricing in more or more accurately reflecting the value of our natural capital. Uh, this also prevents, uh, sorry, this also provides uh, opportunities for, for investment. I think that that was an absolutely brilliant introduction to the whole thing. That was so useful. Thank you. Um, can I ask if anyone would like to jump in? I don't think Jennifer missed anything there. But if any of you have found anything important that you think Jennifer has, please just just wave at me and I'll, I'll let you come in. No, OK, it's not looking like it. So in which case, let, let's move on to some of the, the practicalities of this then. Um, so so the, the next bit then is um, how do your funds deal with supply chain issues, particularly with reference to biodiversity? Um, so exclusions, uh, research in additional research engagement, that kind of things avoidance, supporting and engaging, you know, those three areas I talked about at the start, and also how do you escalate? So I'm going to come on to each of you individually to talk about your specific funds, if I may, and what you do, because I want people to really get a sense that, you know, there are different approaches here, but, but you know, practically, if, if you're an intermediary watching this and you want to go out and talk to your clients, you can say, well, I've heard some, some fund managers who do this, this and this. So Mohan, can I ask you to kick off, please? As the man who um, works for his, you know, worst, uh, most difficult client, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so I think we basically start with a very simple question: that what does this company do, and what is its product and service? Is it necessary in the first instance? So, for example, if you're just selling fizzy, sugary water, then you know, discussing your bottle, you know, your water sourcing and water practices and operational practices in terms of your operating metrics is all irrelevant. We just wouldn't bother. So, you know, this is straight exclusion for us. I would just ignore it. That would also lead to many sort of, for example, the 
the obvious ones would be, for example, the mining related companies, you know, which lead to significant habitat destruction. So, you know, we'd rather sort of um, think about these considerations, you know, when you're thinking about, is it even worth, because then we're only looking for about 50, 60 companies to hold in a particular portfolio. So, so that's an easy one for us. The more tricky one comes when, um, for example, when you look at um, products that are necessary and needed, and there are no easy choices. And we actually mm -hmm. got involved in lots of research on this, and we basically commissioned usually university, um, in, you know, academics or NGOs, because they also tend to come with quite uh, different views from the traditional financial industry research. So for example, an example I'll use here is say palm oil or soybean. Uh, so you know, palm oil is a very efficient oil in terms of all its uses and what uses it can be put to. Um, and there isn't really any other alternative yet. And there are some synthetics emerging, but it's still early days. Um, and it is widely used. So once you sort of commission that research, okay, is it necessary? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, then is, it a, is there a better way of doing it? And then we actually commissioned more research, found a couple of plantation companies in Asia. We said, okay, these are the best practice companies. We spoke to the consumer companies, you know, like the Unilevers and the Nestle's and just to see, okay, how do you source your palm oil? What do you do? What does responsible look like? And I think the, the most useful answers we get is when you ask them, have you actually cut off any supplier? Have you ever said, you know, fired a supplier because Lipmus of poor practices, mm -hmm. right? And that sort of usually tells you, you know, all you need to know. And we've tried both approaches. Uh, so this was one example where unfortunately we in fact even engaged and went all the way. And in the end, it just didn't work. And so we basically said, this is an engagement. We've done it. We've done the research. We published the research. It's available for everyone to, to use. Um, but, but there are limits to how far this works as an investment. And so we basically exited those. But there are others, for example, the soybean one that I mentioned. So there is an investment we hold in a, in a, in a soy drink company. You know, unlike the fizzy sugary water, soy drink is a, you know, is a useful delivery of protein. Um, and so sourcing their soybeans, you know, where do they source it from? And so I think we again got independent research done and then established and then pushed the company to actually publish their sources. So this is a company listed in Hong Kong called White Soy. And, and so then I think we gain, I think the process of engagement also helps us to understand about the quality of the company, because how open and transparent the company's management is tells us a lot about, you know, how they take the issue. Is are they even considering it? Are, yeah. are they are they engaging with the issue? Um, and that helps us to actually paint a picture and actually raise conviction or lose conviction as the case may be over time. And especially because we're looking to invest in any company at the outset for a minimum of 10 years, all these considerations become front and center. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think that's a really interesting split is looking at those products that are necessary and those that aren't necessary. Um, yeah, really, really valuable way of looking at it. Neville, can I come to you next, please? Yes, I think I'd like to just preface the comments by saying that we, we bandy the world crisis around very easily these days. I mean, apparently, if I can't get petrol when I want it, that's a crisis. <laughs> but I think if you look at the whole landscape of biodiversity, I mean, this is really a, a cricket, critical moment in which natural systems are decaying at a rate we've never seen before, with all the implications that follow. Um, so I think we, we need to landscape it in, in, that, in that context. And if you look at that, that kind of risk, we might come on to explore why so many companies don't seem to be doing much about it, or perhaps don't understand their role and impact on biodiversity. So we start from a from a precautionary position, you know, as, as leading investors in screening companies in and out of the funds. Um, anything that has a kind of devastatingly high impact on the environment, which would include biodiversity, um, we would not be persuaded to include that in the funds. So historically, we've had no mining, no oil and gas. We would not invest in palm oil, monoculture type commodities, um, which, are, which are devastating, you know, the richness of the ecology. Uh, we would be forestry adverse. And we've long had an intensive farming screen, which is more around animal welfare. But there is a kind of interesting point at which biodiversity morphs into mm. welfare, because actually the vast majority of animals on the planet are husbanded animals, not 
wild animals. You know, 96% of all mammals on the planet are husbanded, which is quite extraordinary, either humans or husbanded. Sorry, can I ask you to repeat that number? Did you just say 96%? Nine, 96% and 70% of all birds on the planet are poultry. Mm -hmm. So it shows actually that there is a morphing between welfare and, and biodiversity, which, which, which we need to explore. But beyond the exclusions, I think you're then looking at really interrogating companies that you've identified as being in high risk, high impact areas, paper and forestry, chemicals, um, construction, what their biodiversity strategies are, what their plans are, and also the organizations they work with. You know, we're quite impressed that um, quite a lot of companies are beginning to work with wildlife experts in devising those strategies to have an impact on their thinking. And it strikes me that if you're a house builder and you talk to nobody, then obviously you're never going to actually be biodiverse enriching um, your portfolio. You're only going to be taking away. So I think we would be asking those kind of questions. And, and I think, Julie, we're coming on to looking at specific examples. Yeah. Um, and I can and I can talk a little bit about that then. Yeah. Shall I ha hand over to Adam briefly now then, please? Yeah, thanks, Julia. No problem. So so we have a, a whole theme dedicated to sustainable uh, food and agriculture, um, which is obviously linked extremely and intertwined with, with biodiversity. Uh, and in that, we are looking at the transition of the entire food value chain. So we we are investing in companies that contribute to this necessary transition. So we're, we're looking to to effectively invest in companies that are having a positive impact. So in our selection process, you know, we look at the whole food value chain for sustainable choices and innovative solutions. Um, and this goes across agricultural natural inputs, farming practice, food processing packaging, storage and transport, retail, re uh, restaurants and food service and consumption and waste management. So it's the whole value chain from producer and processor to distributor and retailers um, because they are obviously all interlinked in that system. Mm. And we, we look at each individual company when we look to construct our portfolios to, to achieve this objective. And we are looking for the positive contribution to our impact objectives. So if we look at those, we're looking at things like contributing to production and distribution of healthy and affordable food. So, you know, as an example in this, we'd be looking for companies to foster consumption of plant based proteins and alternatives to red meat, promote healthy nutrition and diets and limit in, uh, and improve food processing, promote sustainable agriculture and use of uh, you know, terrestrial and marine ecosystems, promote healthy nutrition and lifestyles, foster consumer awareness and producer accountability and promote sustainable fisheries and protect aquatic ecosystems. Um, uh, and we, we use you know, quantitative and, and more importantly, qualitative data to make the decisions on which companies we're gonna be, be, be holding in our portfolio. Mm. What we then also look to do is make sure that we're not investing or considering any companies that are actually having a negative impact. So we will then take a second look at these companies again with a different view here. And these are linked into our minimum standards, which are group wide, including the bank as well, and are some of the strictest minimum standards in the marketplace. Um, and basically, these uh, standards, the main objective and rationale of them is to ensure we don't invest in companies offering products or adopt behaviours that clash with our vision and beliefs. So if you think about the, the biodiversity piece and the food and, and ag one in particular, we're looking at things such as balanced ecosystems. So we need to take into account something Neville mentioned, which is the animal welfare side of things. We look at the environmental damage and raw material sourcing. We look at the, the ongoing impact in the value chain around things such as inclusive prosperity. So this touches on human rights and labor rights. And then of course, coming down to healthy society, so use of pesticides, animal testing, genetic engineering, and involvement in health, unhealthy products and things like this. So, so you, effectively, yeah. what we're looking to do is, is make sure that we don't invest in any companies that are having a negative impact in any of those areas as well. Lovely, thank, thank you, Adam. Jennifer, could I come on to you next, please? Sure, yeah. So for us, um, <clears throat> just to kind of wrap it up from our side, I think we, for our um, environmental uh, equity strategies um, to come to our kind of investment universe, um, essentially what we're looking for are two things. Um, companies which are one, have a, let's say, uh, lower environmental footprint or one that is within what I'm going to describe a little bit later, a, a framework that we use called the planetary boundaries. Um, and two is that these companies are actually providing uh, products or services or some types of solutions that can actually help to reduce uh, stresses on nature that basically drive 
drive biodiversity loss. And I think the first thing I wanted to mention is that when we look at biodiversity and how to address it, um, it's not really something that can just be addressed on its own, just because the, I mean, it's a very complex topic and the drivers of biodiversity loss are quite multifaceted. But um, if you look at all of the kind of biodiversity reports, there's a couple that really stand out. One is uh, land use change. So for example, a large scale deforestation for cattle farming. Um, the second one is direct exploitation, which is for example, overfishing. Um, then the third one is climate change. Um, so species being unable to adapt to certain kind of climatic changes or weather conditions. And then the fourth one is pollution. So how we incorporate this is um, we, we found a, a scientific framework called the Planetary Boundaries Framework, which is not exclusive to us at all. It's, um, uh, it's actually something that was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center in partnership with a couple of scientists and universities worldwide in 2009, where essentially what they tried to do was identify the most crucial, um, let's say, environmental systems that keeps our biosphere stable, uh, that has been stable for the past hundreds of thousands of years, that are important for uh, human society to be able to operate in. And so within each of these uh, planetary boundaries, there are nine dimensions. Um, one of them is biodiversity, one of them is climate change, but they're all kind of influencing each other somehow. The scientists have uh, identified also, or been able to somehow quantify or uh, describe what they call the safe operating space. So the safe operating space means that as long as we can limit our impact or our stress uh, on these different planetary dimensions to within that safe operating space, then we can be certain that fairly certain that going forward, we don't run the risk of kind of large uh, irreversible consequences. Um, and anything that goes outside of that operating space is basically a large risk uh, for, for human society in the future. And so this is actually a framework that we try to apply or we really uh, we apply and to to our kind of environmental um, strategies where we kind of try to screen through a life cycle assessment what is the actual kind of environmental footprint um, of various different industries or sectors within this planetary boundaries framework so that's just a little bit of a, a description of what we try to use and of course i won't get into the technical details of how we translate this into something that's more uh, operationalized for investment purposes but uh, overall we do have a framework and a model that we use uh, together in partnership with the Stockholm Resilience Center that really helps us to kind of identify this and kind of pin it a bit more to some scientific principles that are underlying. I think um, I, I think that's great too. Your colleagues put me onto that a number of years ago now, and it's it's actually used as the foundation for Kate Woolworth's book Donut Economics, which I would recommend to anybody because that superimposes the whole social bit on top of it. So when we're looking at the interconnectedness of everything, um, it's a really, really good and useful model that, that I found really interesting. Um, so thank, thank you for that, um, Jennifer. Um, can I then come on to the next question, which is about the role investors play? Can I ask you both to, uh, all to keep your answers a little bit shorter for this? Because we've, we've done the introduction. If we just, just, just pinpoint, you know, investors can do this, 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 dot, 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 to, to help address issues in biodiversity and supply chain. Um, who should I start with there? Who, who should I pick on? Um, Adam, you're, you're unmuted, so I'll start with you, shall I? Yeah, no problem, Julia, keep it brief. Um, so, so, what, so as investors, what can we do? Well, clearly we can look to make sure that we're supporting those companies that are having a positive impact and are working hard to make sure that they, you know, they, they secure biodiversity for the future of the planet. We can make sure, uh, and our view is very much to avoid investing in companies that are doing harm and are unable to meet those points that I raised earlier around minimum standards. Um, and then, of course, we can look to engage with companies as well, which is something that we do and we engage for positive change. So we can work with companies to discuss you know, how to help them reduce waste, uh, efforts to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, how they can foster biodiversity. Um, working on fair and transparent value chains and efforts to move towards you know, more sustainable ag processes as well. Um, we can do this in a couple of ways. We can do this individually as a company, which we can do, or we can look at working in collaboration um, with, with uh, other organisations um, such as FAIR and the, uh, the business benchmark on farm animal welfare. Um, and again, make sure that those engagements are ongoing um, and topical um, and Thank you. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Thank you. Great. Good mention of FAIR as well. Um, absolutely. Mohan, can I come on to you next, please? 
Yeah, sure. I think Adam covered a wide uh, yeah. uh, you know, gamut of things that we could do. I think two additional ones I would add to that. One is just, I think we'd also um, do more um, pay for and get more research done and published and share the findings more widely just to sort of improve yeah. our understanding of some of the issues. So I think that's one we, we certainly would um, hope to do more of. Uh, and the second one is, I think, um, shareholder resolutions as well. It's actually quite interesting. I haven't come across too many yet specifically targeting biodiversity, but there are certainly, like we're thinking about it, for example, if I broaden it a bit more, about conflict minerals, for example, in the entire semiconductor chain. And, you know, should we be thinking about, you know, bringing about shareholder resolutions, but can you just please improve your transparency? We just don't know where, you, where you're getting your minerals from. Um, so I think shareholder resolutions can also be a useful uh, way of focusing the board and the company's attention on a particular issue and also probably um, canvassing probably wider support um, across the investor base. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Jennifer, can I come on to you next, please? Sure. I mean, although I don't have that much more to, to add, uh, but I, I think in general, we can describe this in kind of three ways, right? There's, uh, as an investor, there's capital allocation. So diverting away from very, very environmentally destructive industries or, um, and, and kind of investing in the ones that are providing solutions. Um, secondly, there's kind of responsible stewardship. So what uh, Adam um, and Mohan mentioned about engagement and, and, and voting, for example. Um, and then thirdly, a bit maybe more a bit more on the soft side, there's also the signaling aspect. Um, so if we as investors, um, as asset managers start signaling also that this is important to the companies, then you can also have you know, a lot of, uh, also some impact on that side. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. Can I can I just let you know also, Jennifer, there was a question in the chat from you from Jill, Jill Turner, um, asking if you can have a link to the planetary boundaries report. I don't know if Tim or any of your colleagues are on, on today, but if not, um, it'd be really good if you could um, put a link to that. But um, Jill, just to say if you if you search planetary boundaries also. Um, certainly the wider report is available, information is available online, um, and the work that PICTE does, I, I suspect, is easy enough to find. If not, we'll, we'll pick up on that after the session as well, but, but I, I absolutely would recommend that. Um, Neville, um, I, I'm going I'm to throw you a little bit of a curveball with this one, Neville, um, because it strikes me with everything that's been said, and I know you can, you can share this with your eyes shut as well this session, um, I feel a little bit of a clash coming on here with the FCA, given the stuff I've been talking to them about and the fact that we're talking about the importance of um, stewardship and engagement and encouraging change, change. Yet lots of us, and we know the clients that we deal with, really, really like exclusions. Um, so in, in, can, you, can you maybe pick up on that a little bit as well when you're, when you're talking? No, I think we've run into exactly the same issues with the FCA when we've had conversations with them. And Jennifer's absolutely right. The right not to allocate capital is a supreme part of the investment process. Fund managers every day, for all sorts of investment reasons, will decide not to invest in certain companies or sectors. What we're doing is making that an ethical priority. So actually, it's, it's, it's a really firm part of any process. And what you won't invest in is as important as where you do allocate capital for change. But it also strikes me that what we're talking about here is making biodiversity part of every conversation you have with a business. Once you've got good analysis about where the risks are, making that a real forward part of every conversation, it has very little visibility in the USA, this topic. And I think that's one area why collaborative partnerships around biodiversity, mm -hmm. we're screaming out for those. Because actually the UK and Europe speak pretty well on this, long way to go. The US has no visibility really at all. And I'd like to see this subject kind of elevated in the same way as now modern slavery has been escalated to be really on everybody's radars about the importance of taking that into account as a responsible investor. Biodiversity isn't anywhere near that. And you could argue, I'm not, but you could argue that actually in terms of the critical state of nature, this is far more pressing than actually a lot of the modern slavery debate, although that would be a very emotive point to make and I'm not saying that. So every conversation, collaborative partnerships and just changing priorities in the USA as well, I think. Yeah, I think the issue here is there are loads of really important things, eh? And, and you know, if you're a financial advisor watching this, you know, whether it's now or later on catch up, you know, you've, you've got to give clients advice on this stuff and you've got to find something that matches what they want. So we, we need that range of, of options that are available to people because some people just want nothing to do with that. I'm, I'm thinking here about my daughter saying, you know, telling me off for buying Kit Kats. 
probably about two <laughs> years ago now because she'd seen the film the orangutan and it's like yeah we, we this palm oil stuff this is this is bad um so there are so many issues and and you know delighted that my teenage daughter is telling me off for buying certain stuff clearly i shouldn't be eating kit kats anyway but yeah so this this is increasingly high profile but but it hasn't hit everywhere has it and, I, and i'm talking to people also who are saying this is probably going to get us before climate change does so this is actually more important than climate change and i, I don't think most people have got that yet which is why i wanted the descriptor interview in the lunchtime session today if people just put their feet up and watch but thank you that that's that's brilliant but and what you did also there very very cleverly was to lead us on to the next question thank you neville so i was going to lead with adam on this talking about relevant initiatives in this area so um adam would you like to kick off with um talking about big initiatives that, that investors and others are getting behind on this area yeah of course no problem and um i mean i'm not going to comment on the descriptor review because obviously uh that will be uh, a lunchtime thing mm -hmm. um but but clearly it's hugely hugely important and i think i'd just like to say one one point here if we don't act on the recommendations of the descriptor review we risk bankrupting our greatest asset which is this planet and it's all interlinked and as you rightly said julia this is as important and interlinked to climate change as anything else um, so there, there are a few things that we can look at, a couple of uh, initiatives and things to encourage higher standards. So one that's, that's very uh, relevant at this moment in time is the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, the, the TNRFD. Um, so this is delivering a risk management and disclosure framework for organisations to report and act on nature related risks. Um, so that's, that's hugely important uh, and very topical. Um, another another point I made are obviously you can look at the collaborations with the likes of FAIR um, and the BBFW as well. Um, but one of the things that we, we've done at Triodos um, that's really important, we believe, is signing up um, and being a founder of something called PBAF. Um, and this is the Partnership Biodiversity Accounting Financials. And this basically aims to investigate how a bank or an investor can contribute to the, the protection and sustainable use of biodiversity and how the impact of these investments can be calculated or measured. So this is this is a bit like carbon accounting effectively, but this is around biodiversity. Um, so this is something um, that, that's you know, been very um, prevalent for us as a bank. Um, and clearly, I think as Neville stated, we are ahead of the game here in the UK and Europe. Um, and it would be great if we can start trying to get some of this stuff over to the States as well. Um, so, so there are initiatives out there. Um, and again, um, they just need to be sorted out and I'll, I won't yeah, take up any you. more time. Can I, in the interest of time, can I just ask um, if uh, Mohan, Jennifer or Neville, if you think there's any big initiatives there that we're missing in this list for advisors who might want to go away and read up on this later on? No. Well, well I, there's something that comes to mind. I will just mention very quickly, yep. but it's very new. So I have to admit, my, I myself also don't really know much about this yet, but I have been reading that there's a uh, a partnership between the, the New York Stock Exchange and I think the International Exchange Group to come up with a, a new kind of investment uh, called natural asset companies, um, where essentially these are where owners of natural assets, whether it's, um, uh, you know, owners of a certain type of land or whether it's a government that kind of owns land that provides a certain type of ecosystem service are then allowed, are, are given kind of specialized corporation, uh, corporation rights um, so that people can invest in. I think it's very interesting. I mean, obviously this is still kind of very new and it, it's out there, um, but it just goes back to this idea again of how we need to be able to better uh, account for or price in kind of our, our ecosystem mm -hmm. services that we rely on. So I think there's definitely a lot going on in the space. Everything is still kind of new. We're still trying to figure things out as well. But uh, definitely the direction of where we're going, that's something that I think we can all be very mm -hmm. sure on is that, you know, we're going to focus on this going forward, definitely. Yeah, and thank you. I think that's right. But, um, and people do talk about this as being new and, and, and the way we're looking at it now is new. But, you know, deforestation, I was talking about that 30 years ago. You know, a lot of us were, you know, old, old Greenpeace fans and, and, you know, people who are interested, you know, pollution, chopping down rainforests, you know, generally trashing the planet. You know, that, that's not new, but I think biodiversity gives it this real focus. So if I can perhaps come on to you, Neville, then with the next question, can you just give us an example of something your company's done in this area recently with conventional, sorry, with contentious companies? So that could be the companies doing the chopping down or whatever, or the companies that are selling products that people might go, oh, are you sure? You know, the Kit Kat example, Nestle example, or, or beyond. Neville, would you like to touch on that? 
Yeah, sure. So I think if we start the starting point being that we, we do exclude quite a lot of probably the most um, I interventionist type industries. But what we did in 2020 was a thematic piece of engagement because we were quite keen to explore what this looked like. So we had a universe of 20 companies and the objectives were to find out what companies are doing, uh, their motives to act um, and to preserve and enhance diversity and really whether there was any evidence of best practice. And I think what was quite interesting that um, we found that not all companies in quite high impact areas had any kind of plan at all. So that was a surprise, but it echoes what I said earlier about this being quite novel. Secondly, even fewer of those companies in the target list. And we were looking at food retailers, materials, paper and property, construction particularly, even fewer were equipped to measure their impact on biodiversity. And then thirdly, there were kind of small nuggets of really quite exciting. What seems to be the core, and this was UK and, 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 and European mostly, uh, and the pockets of good practice were companies like Imaris working with French Natural History Museum and, and their own biodiversity agencies in developing strategies that could be rolled out across their business. Um, the DEFRA kind of 10% net gain standard seems to be coming quite important to construction, house builders, property development i.e. any kind of development has to leave a net gain in biodiversity. But what some companies said was actually the metric for measuring that is quite tricky. And then the thing we actually explore with house builders, which was, was interesting and, and quite surprising from their point of view, was I think everybody will be familiar with all of these housing developments popping up all over the place with lovely pretty borders that are based on low maintenance, fairly arid plants. And we said, why can't you experiment with pollinators, wildflowers, mm. borders, yeah. which, are, which actually will encourage more diversity and how house builders can make a space for nature using the RSPPs and the BPCs kind of campaign for making a space for nature. Mm. And what they said consistently was if it's not in the planet application, we won't do it. So there has to be government intervention around intelligent planning consent that builds in the possibility of bird boxes, borders, all of that kind of thing to make amenity and not just boxes for people to live in. This mm. kind of inter, intermingling of humans and animals and species and pollinators is a long way from optimal at the moment. But that was a piece that we did that looked across the board at what companies are doing. And I think overall, you know, five out of ten, more to do. I think house builders are a great example. Yeah, five out of 10, I think that, that feels right to me. I'm, I'm just thinking of a house up the road from us that's got AstroTurf instead of lawn in their front garden. And you just have to wonder, yeah. um, you know, what, what the thought process is. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going off, off piece to here again. Mohan, can I ask you to, to comment? Are there things that your company has been doing specifically in this area that you'd like to share? Well, we've been doing lots of, um, essentially, I come back to the research all the time, because I think what happens is we're all generalist investors, and um, we're not an expert in any one particular topic. So we're just thinking, you know, from the coffee I drink in the morning to the mobile phone in my pocket, what goes into each of those things. And, and I think Nestle is a good, interesting example. So there was a, we had an investment in Nestle for seven years, and it was a very difficult investment, because as you can imagine, every controversy that you can touch upon, including bottled water, plastic packaging, um, you know, agricultural sourcing. Um, but I think um, in, in reference to Jennifer's, uh, you know, planetary boundary, uh, you know, we also use something similar. And essentially the idea was if some of these big companies don't change, then you will basically struggle to move, you know, move the needle. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay to back and allocate capital to the small ones bringing innovative solutions, but sometimes you need to push the big ones also. Absolutely. And, and when we conducted some of this research, and this is probably a consumer marketeer, you know, par excellence who basically can greenwash anything, right? So we're trying to sort of uncover, is there any substance in the change since that Greenpeace Kit Kat campaign, you know, that Nestle has professed to have, you know, commenced a campaign to change since then. And the thing is, every piece of research that we do, the company actually ticks quite highly up on, you know, on its efforts, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the most recent one was um, um, we did one on sustainable sourcing of coffee because they said, okay, let's leave the other bits. Coffee is a quarter of the company's business. It's material. And it has a huge upstream supply chain impact because the number of smallholder coffee farmers all over the world is just an incredible number. And if they improve their responsible sourcing practices, it has a huge impact on all the issues we're talking about. 
And I think the, the, the short answer is they were probably at four out of 10 or five out of 10. I mean, they recognize that they need to go further, but there's still a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we no longer have an investment in the company, but I was just trying to explain, you know, sometimes the challenges are very, very vast. And yeah, just, which, which plays to the stewardship piece, doesn't it, again? So, it. And, and making sure that we do have all bases covered, even if um, that there will be controversial companies and some funds which some investors will just want to stay well away from. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to jump in here and say there's some lovely comments in the chats here about things like house builders you know, put holes in walls for hedgehogs and, and be aware of the number of fires and rainforests, you know, destruction over the last 30 years. You know, all this stuff has been going on on our watch. And you know, some of us obviously have devoted our time to trying to trying to shout about these things and get investors to to walk away or engage. But thank you. That's really interesting. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm, I'm just going to, if I may, ask you all just a very quick once round. Of you know, if there's one thing that talking about supply chain and or biodiversity loss, you know, what should an intermediary be talking to their client about to reassure them they're in a fund that isn't involved in habitat destruction? So one thing, Jennifer, may I start with you? Yeah, um, it's a very difficult topic, but I, I would say the one thing I would really point out that is going to be increasingly important going forward is just uh, reporting and transparency. Um, I mean, if, on my side, it just increases the workload by a lot. Um, but I think is there's no way to be able to uh, know, you know, what's going on, where you're investing, unless we get better at reporting and transparency. And at the moment, there are just so many different level kind of yeah. standards and different levels out there. So I do see that at some point this could start converging. Um, but yeah, that would be kind of a priority going forward. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Adam. Could I come to you next? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, Beat I transparency. To, yeah, I, ha I haven't got much to add to that. I would probably suggest if it's an initial conversation for an intermediary, they might want to use something like Fund Eco Market to uh, have a look at some <laughs> for specific instance. funds that tick, tick a box, for instance, given the audience. But no, tra transparency is key um, and, and the reporting um, of what's going on in the, in the investments as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you. Mohan, do you have any additional? I would fully echo that. I think, which is why I think for, for pretty all our strategies, we have full portfolio transparency. And we then basically talk about the issues that we're engaging on, the risks that we see, what is still yet to be done. Um, and then basically write up an engagement report every quarter about you know what we've, what we've done in the last quarter, last year, and all the rest of it. And also um, how are we voting? Uh, yes. You know, transparency yes, on the votes. Absolutely. So, um, so we don't outsource that, we do it ourselves. It's the job of the analyst to sort of do the research and vote and engage. So I think those are probably two, three things, transparency and who does it. I mean, is it the entire investment team? Is it some box somewhere ticked by someone who yeah. everybody ignores? You know, so those yeah. are two, three things I would say would help. Thank, thank you. Um, Neville, can I bring you on to finish before we go into the poll question? So please do all stay on for the poll question. Sure. Um, you'd expect me to go slightly off piece, so I'm going to be Naturally. slightly different. Um, if delegates are feeling a little bit overwhelmed about this subject, I really recommend they have a look at the 2019 State of Nature report. This was the UK government's look, right. looking at the, the state of nature in the UK. It's a really good starting point for just looking at what is going on. There are lots of others. The RSPB did one. Um, there's a UN report. The UN one is obviously global, but I, I would really look at that. And then my second point is just something that is never mentioned. You know, we talked about biodiversity, obviously, on the subject of this. 25% of all biodiversity on Earth, 25% resides on good soil health. And soil health is never talked about. I was taken recently by reading an interview with a soil scientist that works with the National Trust, who works with all of their properties on good soil health to help farming uh, and good farming practice. So should food retailers have soil scientists within their armor? Should house builders have soil scientists that they can advise, use for advice on all of this? Um, it's something that's never talked about, but soil is absolutely key um, absolutely. to good, healthy biodiversity. So slightly off piece, Julia, but you probably expect that from me. Uh, I would expect nothing less. And you know, that, that's, something, <laughs> that's something that Tony Juniper, now I think chair of Natural England or something like that has been talking about. So if, if anyone's, Googling it wants to put it in the chat as well. I, I, do you know what soil, you know, we can't grow stuff without soil and, and the, the health of our soil. I'm a real geek on this stuff too. Um, not that I'm saying you're, a, you clearly are Neville. Um, <laughs> you know, this stuff is, is really, really important. Um, so let, let's come on to the quick poll then, if, if we may. So Sally and Jerry, if you could put the poll up. So um, have you ever had a client ask about this? Like, so a little bit of feedback for, for the speakers on the panel, please. Jerry, if you can make that go live. 
and I, I promise I won't touch it um, and make it stop or anything. Hopefully it wasn't me, but. So, okay, so, you know, we're talking about a pretty, I mean, we've got a lot of people here on, on today's session, actually, whose names I don't know, which is fab. But a lot of people I do know, and they've been interested in this area for a long time, but yet still we've got 52% of people saying they're not having these conversations, they're not coming up. Um, can I have final thoughts from you all on this? So anyone, so maybe Jennifer, I'll, I'll just go down in the line on my thing. Um, any thoughts on um, that? Yeah, maybe not coming up yet, but they will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Mo my Mohan? Thought. Mohan? Um, yeah, I think so. And I think it, it, it has for us, for example, for our clients, I think the institutions are already asking. Yeah. And I think the other thing we're finding is that the younger um, you know, people who especially take over foundations and all that, they're asking very difficult questions. Yeah. So and I think good on them. So yeah, it is yeah. coming. Thank you. Neville? Uh, it echoes my point that this needs to be as visible as modern slavery, but I think yeah. that result is quite surprising given the, the incredible influence that David Attenborough has had on thinking in the last few years, mm. well, over the course of his very long career. Yes, indeed. Adam, final word to you. Just echo everything that everyone said there. It, it's coming and it will become even more prevalent yeah. as the future generations start uh, inheriting the wealth and, and, and demanding it. Yeah. Yeah, lo lovely way to finish. Absolutely. It's, it, you know, this is, this is coming. Um, it may be a thing that younger people understand better at the moment, but there is a lot of information around on this. Maybe we'll look to put some more stuff in the chat later for you. Um, with that, I will close and say thank you so much to all of you for what was a really lovely panel. Um, really enjoyed that. And I hope people watching also did.